I don't see it, but I'm assuming we are recording. Um, hello, everyone. This is Carol Scott with the National Ombudsman Resource Center. I want to welcome you to today's webinar on cultural and linguistic competence, what it means for ombudsman programs. Um, you have um, in the Zoom uh, the ability to put questions in the Q&A box, and you also have the opportunity to share with the chat function. Um, we also are going to be um, taking uh, some uh, polls, so um, you'll need to uh, be watching for those, and we look forward to your being a part of today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and you are welcome to uh, look at it at a, a later date or to share it with others in your program. Um, we will be sending out a link to where on the website it can be found. And following this uh, presentation, there will be a survey monkey that comes up and we would very much appreciate your feedback. Um, we will be putting into the chat fu function um, links to the various um, uh, PowerPoints in just a second. So um, thank you for joining us today. We have two basic goals for this webinar. One is to uh, better understand the definitions and conceptual frameworks for cultural competence and linguistic competence and really look at how, what they mean to the ombudsman program, the staff and volunteers. And the second uh, uh, main goal for this webinar is to uh, acquaint you with two different programs that provide professional development and training. Um, one is on the topic of implicit and explicit biases, and the other is on the unique uh, culture uh, related to understanding or underserved lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transitional, transgender um, folks who live in long-term care. So um, both of those uh, trainings, you'll be getting just a snippet of what it's like, but you will have access to, to be able to see the entire program if you wish to um, present that, uh, the entire program to your uh, fellow ombudsman. So with that, I would like to um, just mention that in the state operations manual, appendix PP, which is where the uh, federal government has their F tags, um, the, that um, cultural competence is mentioned 26 different times. Um, and two of the main points that they um, have put in about cultural competency is that in the training and proficiency of nurse aides, there is an expectation that staff be trained on cultural competency. So this might at some point when things are a little bit normal uh, might be a question that you might want to ask the nursing homes that you enter is what are you doing to um, help staff uh, become competent and to feel um, um, well versed on what cultural competency and, um, and li linguistic uh, competency is and how are you training on that the other one, uh, the other major focus of cultural competency within the PSPP has to do with FTAG 553, which says that the facility shall inform the resident of the right to participate in his or her treatment and shall support the resident in this right. And part of that is the planning process must incorporate the resident's personal and cultural preferences. So there is an expectation that nursing homes um, understand what, what um, a resident's uh, personal and cultural preferences are. And we think that the training today will really help you better understand these topics to look not only um, at what a nursing home might, how they might be um, doing this work in the facility, but also an opportunity for you to look and see how is this um, impacting you and your program and how um, well are you um, versed in cultural and linguistic competency. Our speakers today are Tuara Good. She's an assistant professor at Georgetown University. 
Um, she is the uh, director of the National Center for Cultural Competence. Um, Sarah Gussler, and I will tell you that Tawara loves to travel, um, and her favorite uh, late night snack is dark chocolate with caramel and sea salt. So you can chat in if that's one of your favorites. Our next speaker will be Sarah Gussler. Sarah is a local long-term care ombudsman from Michigan, and she will be talking about bias. Um, Sarah loves to play the guitar and ukulele. She works at cross stitching um, and says it's just a fun thing to do, but maybe not up to the talent of some people. Um, Sarah loves ice cream. Um, Joe Rodriguez is the state ombudsman in California, and Joe loves listening to music, uh, especially British pop. And his favorite late night snack is Chex Mix, Chex Mix or popcorn. So I um, appreciate these people, uh, Tawara, Joe, and Sarah. And I, at this point, Tawara, I'm going to turn the program over to you. Thank you. And I'm going to share my screen. And your camera. All right. And my camera. All right. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think it's afternoon for everyone from the East Coast to the West Coast. Not too sure if someone's as far away as Hawaii. I, I really thank Carol and um, the Resource Center for this opportunity to speak with you today. I have a lot to share in a short amount of time. We are going to try and make this as interactive as possible. I know that Carol shared with you that I'll be doing some polling questions and also I'm will encourage you to have active use of the chat feature. So we will start. So um, our objectives for today is to be for you is, are to define culture and cultural diversity, examine the multiple dimensions of culture, again, within the context of long-term care, to describe a conceptual framework for cultural competence and also for linguistic competence, and lastly, being able to apply these frameworks and these concepts to your roles and responsibility within the ombudsman program, um, including staff and also volunteers. So um, we really can't talk about cultural competence without really first talking about what is culture. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that first. And as, I, um, as we talk about uh, culture and it's, it's multiple manifestations, I want you to be thinking about this particular scenario. I'm gonna read it briefly to you. An ombudsman received a call from the daughter of a long-term care facility resident. The daughter is frantic about her mother's well-being because she has been restricted from, um, from seeing her mother um, during the, her normal visits with her daughter for, for two weeks because of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, she's adamant that her mother will be neglected and receive inferior care because of her race and that there have been documented incidences in the past of racial insens insensitivity. The daughter cites studies about racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare, including in long-term care facilities. And so as, as, we, um, as we speak, both Sarah and, and, and Joseph, I really want you to, to consider the scenario and contemplate these questions. What are the cultural factors presented in this scenario? And what would you do as an ombudsman receiving this call? All right, this is a transition slide. So as we think about what is culture, um, I'm gonna sh share a number of frameworks and, and definitions for thinking about culture. We look at culture, first of all, as being learned. And when we say the culture is learned is that we teach children our culture from the time they're born. Um, we teach them what it means to be a member of the family. We teach them gender, gender roles. We teach them language. We teach them right from wrong. So we actually um, um, indoctrinate our, our children into our own culture. And I think what's really very important when you think about what is culture, since culture is learned, sometimes we have to unlearn culture, particularly in um, a variety of social service and healthcare settings. Um, 
if those, if those cultures are not compatible with the populations being served. And so as we think about culture, again, um, it, it is really uh, learned and shared knowledge, really looking at how people understand and live in the world. And culture applies to everyone um, from a political perspective or a professional perspective or a racial or ethnic perspective or any kind of social group. And we also know that culture is transmitted from generation to generation. So that there are things that your parents handed down to you that you may still uh, do. There are things that your um, teachers and others in your, uh, that you've had your education with share with you that you continue to do. And so as we think about culture, what's interesting is, is that there are aspects of culture that remain the same, yet there, but yet culture is constantly changing. More about culture. As we think about culture, it really is looking at our beliefs about reality. It's, it's, it's how we interact with each other, what we know about each other, and how we indeed um, would interact in, in different environments. So culture is reflected in our religion, our customs, our technologies, and very much the technologies that we're, we're using right now. If we didn't have these technologies, we would not be able to hook up in this way. Um, it includes how we work, how we parent, how we love, marry. It includes how we understand illness and wellness, uh, disability and end of life. This um, slide I, I love, it's um, older. It's from 1992, it's from the early childhood literature. And I really love this uh, because it's, it's uh, you, you get such a good picture when, you're, when you hear this. And so as we think about culture, it's like someone standing in front of a one-way mirror. We often only see things from our own lens. As we think about cultural competence in particular, it really is about getting to the other side of the glass. It really is about being able to see perspectives other than our own. And while that's really easy for me to say and to create a slide for, it is very difficult to do on an ongoing and consistent basis. So we know that culture is applicable to all people. Sometimes when I'm doing this training and I engage in this exercise and ask people who are sitting next to each other to please just share one thing about your culture. And sometimes they get blank stares and then sometimes they get responses like, I don't have a culture. It's like, yes, 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 you have a culture. No, 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 I don't have a culture. I'm just plain old American. And whatever plain old American is, it is rich with cultural um, traditions. And so, we have to really think about culture applies to all people, not just people of color. Um, again, this is a laundry list of things as we think about culture. I'm not gonna go through all of them. I wanna highlight again that culture can be at a conscious or unconscious level, um, that it provides a group identity, uh, that it can be thick, thin or compartmentalized um, overall, and that it permeates many aspects of our life but we don't tend to look at the world always through a cultural lens. This is the iceberg concept of culture. And generally in, in person, I'm able to do this activity. Um, and it's a sad look, looking little iceberg because I drew it and the line going across is waterline because we know that only one tenth of what we see above the waterline uh, of an, an, that would be visible above the waterline for an iceberg. Everything else is submerged, and we can use this as an analogy when we think about culture. Oftentimes, people pay attention to how someone looks, how they speak, their physical characteristics. But as we think about culture, much of it is invisible to us. Um, and it includes the things that you see here, and even more, it just simply wasn't a lot of space to um, include it on one slide. So, again, Many things as we think about culture will remain hidden unless we probe it, unless we're tuned into it. Um, this is an ex uh, example of the Hayes model it's from the counseling um, literature. And she looks at um, this, this um, acronym looking at addressing. And her original language looks at age, disability, and she does uh, distinguish between whether it's congenital or acquired. Excuse me, I'm sneezing. Sorry about that. Um, then also looking at religion, I added spirituality or no affiliation because we can't assume that everyone is religious um, by nature. Uh, she uses the term ethnicity, which is indeed the correct term. However, in our country, we uh, 
from its inception have focused on race. Um, we look at um, sexual economic status, um, sexual orientation, indigenous heritage, national origin. And lastly, uh, the addressing model indicated gender. I included gender identity and expression. So our first polling question that should come up, we're asking you how, uh, how consistently do you consider these factors um, as diversity factors related to long-term care? And so we're gonna ask you to check which ones you indeed um, consider on an ongoing basis. And for some of it, you mean you can scroll just a little bit down um, to see this. And which do you tend to overlook? And to our, as people are voting, I think we only gave them one choice. Okay, so, good. Just respond to that choice. But yeah. both, it so, both came up on the screen though. Is we wanted them to respond to which do you tend to overlook? Right. So this this first question is, uh, what do you uh, consistently consider? And then the second poll will be, what do you overlook? So there are okay. actually two, two different questions. Okay. All right then. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. It is down below. So there's two times people need to vote. One one. Which element of addressing do you consistently consider? And the second is, which do you tend to overlook? So we'll wait just a few more seconds for people to um, enter their, their responses. And, uh, you can let us know um, when, uh, and, or put the results up on the screen when you think most people have voted. Just a few more seconds or so. Yeah, let's give it about sure. 10, more, 10 more seconds. We've got, got about uh, half, half the people have voted. Okay. So Tor, I, I don't wanna be the dumb one here, but what is congenial, congen Genital? Genital. Yeah, so that's a disability that you're born with. Ah. And we also know that the next one is acquired, and those are things that may happen to us in life that cause us to have a disability. Okay, okay I'm going you. to share the results. Okay, can you see the results? I can't on my screen, but others may be able to. So I, uh, so the first question was, uh, so, and I apologize, some people are having trouble not being able to uh, should submit I do their stop, answers. Should I do stop share? Oh, there it is. Do you see it? All right. Um, so it does look like age might be the primary thing that people are thinking about long-term care, which makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, national origin is way down 3%, and indigenous heritage is at, is at 2 So if we close that and go to the next one to see which ones do you tend to overlook. Yeah, you'll just need to scroll down. Oh, sorry. I am scrolling. All right. So again, um, socioeconomic status, actually sexual orientation seems to be the highest in terms of what may get overlooked um, overall. So I think that this is instructive to us as we think about um, services and supports to the broad range of people, um, individuals that may be in long-term care. Thank you so much for completing that. All right, and we're gonna go to the next slide. Okay. Um, this is a concept of multiple cultural identities, and you probably have heard this um, a lot. And this, this basically says that a lot of times, uh, say for instance in the disability community, that there's a great deal of emphasis on the disability. And sometimes people who are with them only see them through that lens. Um, and so as we think about this whole notion of multiple cultural identities, we all have multiple cultural identities. Um, however, some people may identify more strongly with one identity 
Say for instance, I'm just making this up. I'm a grandmother and happy to be a grandmother. And so I may identify overly with that group. Um, um, as we look at the next one is compartmentalization. And this means that people have multiple cultural identities um, inside themselves, but they may not show all those identities to you for a variety of reasons. And lastly, um, integration. And this is where people have multiple cultural identities and they're all integrated together. So I think of myself as an African-American woman. Um, uh, I'm a, I am a wife. I am a mother. I am a grandmother. I work at a university. Um, I'm a sister. Um, I'm an aunt. All of these are, are things that make me who I am. And then there's this other concept that's very important when we think about intersectionality. And this is based on the work of Kimberly Crenshaw. And I'm sure that you've heard this word a lot. I think that oftentimes people don't use the word correctly. Um, I think that oftentimes they're talking about multiple cultural identities, yet they are saying intersectionality. And this is when someone may belong to, um, have membership in multiple social groups. And because of that membership in those groups, they are more likely to be marginalized, more likely to be discriminated against. And so that um, this is a, a polling question for you. Um, again, thinking about this whole notion of, of multiple cultural identities that we all have these identities and intersectionality, how much attention um, do ombudsman's programs pay to these concepts in their work? And maybe we have the polling question, please. So we'll have, um, I don't know, it sh this one shouldn't take long. We should be done with this in, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. How's the um, response coming along? We're at 58%, so I will stop and share the results. Okay, thank you. So um, people are saying, yes, there's a lot of attention to uh, multiple cultural identities, um, not as much uh, uh, attention paid to um, um, intersectionality within ombudsman's programs. Thank you so much. We'll close that and we're gonna move along. So, so far we've been talking a lot about uh, culture as it relates to people. We have to also pay attention to organizational culture. I'm not going to detail about this. I think it, it is very well explained on the slide and you'll have um, copies of this, uh, this slide. Um, uh, you'll, you will be given copies of the slide or be able to access this, uh, these slides in the future. But we just can't think of only the people. We also have to think about the culture of the organization. Uh, and we think about long-term care has unique culture, which would be different than, say, for instance, pediatric care or um, other, other forms of health care. And so that's also very important. We also have to think about how people think about long-term care. Um, you can think about the, the, the uh, scenario that I shared with you, that there's this huge fear about um, family members being in long-term care centers uh, because they're con um, congregate in nature and the possibility for diseases to, uh, to be able to uh, thrive in those settings. So these are some things that I want you to really uh, remember and think about in terms of culture. You are a cultural being and that you have multiple cultural identities. And one of those identities may indeed be your professional discipline or your role as ombudsman. That you view and interpret the world through your own cultural lens, which is comprised of both individual and group experiences that your cultural frame of reference may not be shared by the individuals um, who seek services from um, ombudsman programs. Your worldview or cultural frame of reference influences your approach and responsibilities associated with your position. And it is also influenced by the culture of the organization um, that you are uh, as an employee or volunteer. And lastly, cultural frame of reference contributes to biases 
And so it's necessary to really identify and acknowledge and address such biases when they interfere with your capacity um, to perform the work of ombudsman. So again, just summary thoughts about culture. Uh, this is the quickest I've been through um, um, culture in a long time. And so if we revisit and we think about this particular scenario, um, and in terms of this daughter being frantic, not being able to reach, reach the, uh, her, her mother, um, feeling that her mother would get inferior care because of her race, and being, having read some, some studies, um, again, I'm encouraging you to think about what are the cultural factors you see, and please put those in the chat feature. And then what would you do if you received this call? If you could please put that in the chat feature. Thank you so much. So rule number one, we have to have a solid appreciation for an understanding of culture, both your own and the cultures of others. So we're going to spend a quick time looking at cultural diversity and looking at what that looks like in the United States. This is just uh, data about who lives in the United States from 2018 from the US Census. It's the most current data that we indeed have available to us. We won't get 2019 data to sometime in the fall. And so as we um, uh, look, at, um, look at this, I want to call your attention to the category some other race and also two or more races. Those are significant numbers of people that live in the United States that basically say under some other races, no matter the categories that you have, I don't belong to that. I don't self-identify that way. Um, and so I think that's important for us to know as we think about forms and also ways in which we're engaging people. And then looking at the next one, two or more races, in fact, that's one of the fastest growing groups in the United States in terms of demographics. And so how does this all play out with um, individuals who are in long-term care whether they're in um, institutional care or receiving services um, in, in other settings and the families uh, that you may be interacting with. So if we think about cultural diversity broadly, it really is looking at um, how people self-identify. And there's a whole range of things that you see on this slide. I'm not going to read them all, but it, it includes all of these things as we think about cultural diversity. And I think sometimes in this country, we confuse a lot um, culture and, and, and race and ethnicity and that this is about culture that we're all cultural beings and these are aspects of it um, including our racial and ethnic identity so these are factors that may influence cultural diversity among individual groups again way too long um, to get through during this call i do call your attention to ra cultural racial and ethnic identity um, when we think about cultural racial and ethnic identity sometimes people confuse those, uh, they conflate those. Um, I like to share with you just very quickly, a colleague of mine for many years had done training and, um, and when he was looking at uh, cultural, racial and, um, and ethnic identity, really looking at sometimes how people conflate and confuse those. And as he saw a person in the audience who happened to be the only person of color in the audience, he, he thought she was African-American. And on break, she let him know her real identity. And she told them, hey, look, you know, I'm Panamanian and I mean it. And so even though people may look a particular way and we often make assumptions, that does not mean that their look really tells us who they are in terms of their, their identity and how they self-identify. And so again, these are lots of things that we think about, age and life cycle issues, um, the lived experience of disability or mental illness, languages that people speak, the family constellation. These are all kinds of things that we know. The next is looking at external factors. And um, as we look at external factors, there are many things that may be going on in various states, various communities that may, uh, that may make it very difficult for certain um, ethnic or, or, or cultural groups. I can really think about some of the external uh, factors that may indeed impact how gay, lesbian, transgender um, uh, are, folks are seen, um, and particularly in long-term care and in aging situations. So these are all the kind of, of factors that we need to consider and think about. So rule number two is that we have to recognize and respect and respond to the within group differences among all people, everybody who's receiving long-term services and supports. Um, that one size does not fit all, that we really have to individualize. So that was my 
song and dance on, on culture. We're I'm just moving quickly because then we need to talk about cultural competence and linguistic competence. If you're reading the literature at, at, at for any amount of time, you're going to see it many, many different words. You may see culturally aware, you may see culturally uh, uh, appropriate, you may see cultural responsiveness. I suggest to you that they are interrelated, but they all mean something different. And so I'm going to talk to you today about what is cultural competence. The framework for cultural competence um, is the framework that we used was created, as my son would say, back in the day in 1989. And it was done in actually in children's mental health. I would say that now we see this framework broadly applied across multiple systems of care services and supports, um, including even law enforcement officials that have requested training in this area. And so as we think about cultural competence, it really does require that organizations have a, a congruent set of values and principles. So that they must be congruent, meaning they can't say we have this value and we have this principle if it really isn't congruent with their policies, their structures, their practices, the behaviors and attitudes that you see within that. And so as we think about cultural competence, it really enables uh, organizations and their personnel to really work effectively cross-culturally as we have described it. Um, so it's not cross-racially or cross-ethnically, but looking at it broadly in terms of cross-cultural. There are five elements of cultural competence. Um, and I'm just gonna go through these really, uh, really very quickly. We have to be able to acknowledge cultural differences which is what we're somewhat doing today. You have to have the capacity to understand your own culture. That, that means your family of origin, that means your, the discipline in which you're trained. But to really understand your own culture is very difficult to talk about understanding culture of others when we have not looked internally ourselves. Engage in self-assessment, um, and this can be tools, this can be self-reflection to help you really think about culture and how um, you engage with culture, um, both your own and with others. Uh, cultural competence is not um, by osmosis, it is intentional. So that means that people have to be deliberate in acquiring knowledge and skills. And lastly, we have to be able to view behavior within a cultural context. So no matter how odd a behavior may seem, um, there's some, um, some reason for it. And if we had more time, I would just tell many tales out of school about my mother and the multiple doctor appointments I went with her with and other kind of social services. Um, as we look at cultural competence at an organizational level, organizations have to truly value diversity. They can't say it and just have it up on a website or in brochures. It really has to be reflected in how that organization works. We have created any number of organizational self-assessment instruments um, to conduct uh, an assessment of the policies, procedures, and practices um, within an organization. That's an important element. Being able to ma manage the dynamics of difference, meaning uh, not just the differences among the patients, but also among the staff and the communities that are served. Um, being able to embed cultural knowledge. Um, sometimes there's like one person within an organization that seems to be the keeper of a certain set of knowledge about a certain set of people. Um, if we think about that person and for some reason that person leaves and goes off to join Joseph in, um, in sunny California, then all of the knowledge about serving a particular group of people walks out the door. If that organization has not invested in how to embed this in across their policies, their values, their structures, and their services. So again, this is how we're thinking about uh, cultural competence. It has to be at every level of an organization, at the policymaking level, at the administrative level, at the practice and service delivery level, among individuals and families, and at the community level. I would say when we look at the literature, almost all, a lot of the literature focuses on what you could do at the practice level. I suggest to you it's difficult to be, say, uh, culturally competent ombudsman in an organization um, or within a program that doesn't support you with policies, procedures, and resources. So we're at a polling question again. So has the ombudsman program in which you are an employee or volunteer reached consensus on what cultural competence means and how cultural competence relates to the work of the program? And so we'll have a poll, please. And this one should be short. You have just uh, a couple responses, yes, no, or don't know. 
Laura, while they're answering, the, a question came up, are there any tools to help one understand their own cultural orientation? Yes, there are numerous tools. And what I can do is, um, that's broad because we have multiple cultural identities. So if you're talking about, uh, I'm gonna give something practical. Um, reading and reading about one's own culture, like history, I mean, just because you are born into a particular racial ethnic group, doesn't mean that you culturally know everything about that group. So that's one thing. There are just a range of online training resources. Um, and then also engaging in communities um, to get to know people on an individual basis. But I can send some more things to you, Carol, to be able to send out, okay? Okay, that would be great. And one last quick one. Organizations want diversity, but that doesn't always move to inclusiveness. Should that, that be stressed? Um, yes, it, it should be stressed in terms of, uh, and it's not just uh, inclusion. Um, I, we've been doing some work in this area that I can be included in an organization as I'm, I'm there, I'm at the table, I'm a member of the management team, but that doesn't always translate into a sense of belonging. And so I think that we have to look at, 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 at both at a minimum how people are included, meaning like the policies that support inclusion and the spirit in which people across all demographic groups are indeed included. So if we look at this, 38% of folks saying, yes, their organization has done this work, 29% um, says no, and 33% said they don't know. All right, thank you for responding. We'll go to the next slide, please. I mean, I'll go to the next slide, please. All right, we're gonna look at what is linguistic competence. And I'll share with you some demographic um, data I think is important. Again, this may look very much different in your state or um, region. But uh, again, if we look at uh, uh, this, over 20% over of the population speaks a language other than English at home. Um, this gives you an idea of the variety of, of language groupings that are covered under these large banners that the census gives us. And so typically when I have a lot more time, we, we ask people to name like the top five languages other than English and American Sign Language that may be spoken in their um, geographic locale. So I'll just put that out there. And if somebody wants to like take it on in the chat feature, um, that would be great. Uh, again, this is data from the census. Um, we know that it will be updated soon, but it says 99% of nation's households speak English or one or more of these 12 languages that are listed there. Um, and so again, um, we are a multilingual um, nation, and I would say that would have been um, consistent with, with the languages spoken here since its inception. So again, these languages may or may not look the same in your state or locale. This I think is really important, especially if we're looking at supporting the parents and families, uh, uh, families of, of individuals who may be receiving long-term long care. Um, and also uh, parents, uh, particularly for those that may be young and find themselves in a long-term care situation. So this is from the US Census Bureau and it used to be called the linguistic isolation. Now it's referred to as limited English speaking households. So that tells us in the US, 44% of uh, households uh, are, 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 have uh, limited English uh, proficiency. And that is going to look totally different in California. I was out doing training there um, before we had the, the shutdown and, and that sort of thing, that those numbers look totally different. And so these are households where no one over age 14, no one over age 14 speaks only English um, and also speaks English in another language very well. So that's significant when we look at these percentages, 21.3% of Spanish speaking households uh, those Indo-European language households that you saw, 15%, 24.2% for Asian and Pacific Island languages. And then uh, we look at other languages where they group a number of languages together. So that, that is significant. And it, it, it begs us to think about how are we communicating well, A, with individuals who may be um, in these categories and or their families. So if we look at what is linguistic competence, it really is um, the capacity of organization everyone in that organization to be able to convey information 
in a way that's plain language, easy for people to understand. That's one thing. The other is that uh, it may need to be adapted for people who have limited English proficiency, people who may not be literate, either in English or their language of origin, people who have low literacy skills, um, individuals who have disabilities um, as a result of health issues or just congenital issues, and lastly, those who are deaf or hard of hearing. And we looked at linguistic competence much, much broader than simply language access, um, which is required by law. We wanted to really be uh, more inclusive of many populations that have communication needs, and that's what you see here. It also says for um, linguistic competence that people that work within organizations and their providers really have to be able to address health literacy and mental health literacy. And this is so very important when we think about people that are in long-term care. Um, the language that we use, you know, the, the forms that we have, the kind of brochures that we disseminate is, is really very important. And lastly, uh, linguistic competence within an organization says that there are policies in place. There are structures in place. Um, there are practices and procedures that are in place. And most importantly, that there are dedicated resources so that I read grants often and people will say, I'm gonna serve this linguistically diverse population. I go straight to the budget to see if anyone has budgeted a dime to pay for uh, such services, such as interpretation, translation, and other kinds of things. And so this is how we're thinking about the concept of a linguistic competence. These I'm just gonna go through very quickly. Um, there is law, um, federal law. So if you are a federally funded program, meaning directly or indirectly via contract, that you have a responsibility to ensure um, that the, um, to ensure civil rights are protected. And this basically says that um, civil rights includes, um, and includes national origin and language is considered a part of that. And that is, a, is an excellent resource for you. And I just put that there. When we think about who does Title VI, Title VI protect, it, it, it protects everybody. And it's not limited to people um, uh, who, um, uh, it, it's not, it protects everybody, including um, it's not limited to people who are US citizens. So these are all resources for you. This is another resource for you saying who needs to ensure um, language access um, in terms of providers. And again, this is only for federally funded programs, not for private pay for programs who's covered under uh, Title VI, and you can see those uh, agencies that get uh, Medicaid, um, uh, state, local, and county health agencies, um, and nursing homes, um, hospitals, um, et cetera. This is another resource for you. Um, again, uh, we'd be able to click on the link, but it gives you really deep, um, not deep, but a thorough explanation and around what is Title VI and how it plays out and that we can't have discrimination. So this is our, I think it's probably our last polling question. So do you know if the ombudsman program in which you are an employee or volunteer has a language access plan? Because that's required by federal statute. So yes or no, that's a question. And the second part is how familiar are you with the plan? Very familiar, somewhat familiar, not familiar at all. And um, we can have the polling question, please. And while that, uh, while people are voting, um, one person wrote in that the old staff doesn't want to understand other cultures and respect for each other, which, you know, as we know, sometimes happens in an organization. All right. So you're saying that the old staff, I'm not sure what that means as an age or that they've just been there for a while. Um, I think it means they've just been there for a while. Um, that um, they don't really have an option if that's the way the organization is going. And so that um, um, in order to make services and support equitable um, and appropriate for all, then they, they would need to do this or they would need to maybe be searching around for another opportunity for employment. Yeah, and the other comment was um, question, can you screen, can you screen for cultural competence prior to hiring, so you know know where to begin training with each individual. So as I think about cultural competence is a developmental process. Um, while I've been doing this for a long time, 
I don't consider myself an expert or that I know all there is to know. So I continue to learn and grow in, in my work. And so I think that um, I'm not too sure about screening or quote testing for cultural competence, but certainly in the interview process, you could have questions. You could have questions that looks odd that would ask them, um, you know, what's been their experience working within diverse communities? Um, so that it, it's just a quote natural part of the interview of the interview process. Um, or or if they're unfamiliar, would they be amenable to training? So I think that these are the kinds of things that you should be able uh, to ask people that wouldn't be kind of discriminatory in um, the hiring process. Great, thank you. Can we have uh, the results, please? All right, so um, over half says that they, they indeed um, um, know about the plan. So that's over half. And then how familiar are you with this plan? 52% that says not familiar at all. So I'm encouraging you to go back to your respective settings to ask, you know, what's your language access plan? Again, if it's a federally funded program. Close and we're gonna move on quickly. Okay. Um, another aspect of linguistic competence is health literacy, which is so very important in terms of long-term care. Um, and services and support. And so as we think about health literacy, the Department of Health and Human Services really looked at it as an individual responsibility, as you see on the slide. However, with more research and more work, um, particularly the work of Rima Rudd, um, that they're saying it's not just, the onus is not just on the person. It also has to be on the uh, long-term care or the other healthcare entity to make sure that they're engaging people in a way that they can understand. So I think that that's really important and there's a resources for you. There's another resource that looks at the, the interrelationship or the interaction between health literacy and culture. Um, it's really self-explanatory. Um, and uh, so it, but it, it's like people from different cultural backgrounds, health literacy is affected by their belief systems and their communication styles and understanding and response to health information. So we, as we're looking at not screening for this, but taking this into consideration um, overall. And there are some validated health literacy tools that are available both in English and Spanish. So quickly, this is looking at the role of the ombudsman. I looked at um, um, the resources, the listing on the website and thought, well, how can I then do a crosswalk that would compare, um, the, uh, compare the two? And so, um, if we look at the first, resolve some complaints made by or for residents of long-term care. A way to think about this from the lens of cultural and linguistic competence is that the person employs a complaint resolution process that examines and addresses issues of stereotyping, implicit and explicit bias, which you'll hear about today, um, discrimination, racism, and other isms. If we look at the second one, and these are just examples. Um, that there could be much, much more, but these are just examples. Educates consumers and long-term care providers about residents' rights and good care practices. And this is, provides education that usually is, that uses culturally and linguistically competent approaches that is accessible. It takes literacy into consideration. It takes health and mental health literacy in consideration, and it is tailored to the intended audience. So again, education is not one size fits all. Promote community involvement through volunteer opportunities. And this means that we have to know how to enter communities, learn the cultural norms of those communities, and interact respectfully within these culturally and linguistically diverse communities. And lastly, that we have to pro uh, it's provide information to the public on nursing homes and other long-term care facilities and services residents' rights and legislative and policy issues. That's, that's, a big, that's a big task. And so this is basically saying we have to be able to provide information in multiple languages, and again, and in formats to take literacy, health and mental health literacy into consideration, and also the needs of people whose communication may indeed be impaired because of disability. So this is pretty much, I think, my, my um, Oh, we have a couple more. Advocate for the residents' rights and quality of care in nursing homes. So this means that being able to understand and respond to the cultural implications of advocacy, all right? 
so that everybody doesn't advocate or understand advocate, uh, advocacy in the same way. So that would be for the resident, for the individual and the family preferences, and also the lived experience that people may have had in the legal system in the United States, that they've not had a positive experience and advocacy didn't get them anywhere. And so that's something that we need to think about. Um, looking at disparities people experience due to health and um, looking at that at the organizational level and at the, um, at the individual level. So much that was played out in the scenario that we saw earlier uh, that I introduced. Being knowledgeable of the rights of lawful permanent residents in the US. Um, people assume that someone looks a certain way, speaks a certain way, that they are an immigrant. And sometimes with that, immigrant may go, well, are they, are they lawfully in this, in this country? We need to know what that all means. And then activities are conducted in languages other than English. And our last one is promotes the development of citizens organizations and family councils and resident councils. I, I did question the term citizen organization because there are many people who live in the US who are lawfully present, but they are not necessarily citizens. And the citizens could mean, I don't know, the citizens of the nursing home, but that was something that I had a question about. So it ensures that family and resident councils represent the racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity of the geographic locale. Very important. Um, so that the councils don't all look the same. Respond to cultural differences within and between the cultural um, uh, members, just as the example was given that um, some of the quote older staff um, don't want to address these, these, these differences in our population. Um, that those matters may play out also in the councils and we need to be able to attend to those. And then we have to be cognizant of the power differentials just based on age, based on race, based on um, class or socioeconomic status and based on disability. So these are just some things for you to think about as it relates to, um, as it relates to your role. And I'm gonna end on this. Um, I love this, it came from a um, public, it came from a, a county public health department. And it used to say it's a culturally competent manager and we asked for permission, we've been using it for a long time. And as we think about what we've been talking about today as it relates to cultural and linguistic competence, I'm capable of interacting positively with people who do not look like, communicate like, move like, think like, believe like, act like, love like, live like me. And so that really concludes my presentation um, today. Um, I'm happy to get into the chat feature now um, and stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Tawara and Sarah. If you will gear up with sharing your screen and your um, camera yeah awesome Great. thank you hello so i'm going to start sharing my screen and as i told um carol and the other panelists when we started i do we do have um some some storms rolling through northern michigan where i live today so hopefully we'll be able to to get through this without any disruption my apologies if we if we have any problems um so um, my name is sarah gussler i'm a local long-term care ombudsman and um one of the things that I really like in my role is being able to provide education. Um, I learn more, I will always say this, I learn more by teaching others than I could ever learn just reading or even experiencing. I think when you have to learn enough to teach someone else something, um, it, it just digs deep into you. So um, teaching about bias in healthcare is really important. And my goal today is to help you all feel confident and comfortable to um, design your own bias training program, especially, you know, to give definitely within your local ombudsman groups or your state ombudsman groups, but also within the nursing homes where we work, um, because we, we all see it all the time. There's bias everywhere and we all have bias. Hopefully I can move to the next slide. So, um, start with, of course, we want to talk about what bias is. So, of course, bias is the and sometimes unreasoned judgment. So, just that statement kind of creates a defensiveness in the people who are going to be attending your sessions. So, the first thing that um, you know I, I think needs to be considered when you're going to go into a facility and you're going to talk to to their teams about bias is to try to decrease the defensiveness that might come 
just by knowing they have to go to this training. So start off by telling them that everybody has bias. This is a, the basic, you know, biology, basic survival mechanisms, but they can change when they are unwarranted biases. So you, it's easy to, to talk about examples with the group of biases that we have that help us to survive. Um, you know, right back to, to fundamental being an animal, right? Um, we have biases. We don't eat the bright colored mushrooms, those, those types of things. And setting it down as a basis that we know these things exist. Our job is to, to recognize when these biases are unfounded and, and aren't healthy for what we're doing. They, they don't help anything along. Um, explicit biases are easy to recognize. These are biases that um, people kind of wear on their shoulders. They, you can see them easily with people and people will say, yes, I, I believe this and, and this is what I believe and this is how it is. But implicit bias is really a major problem, especially in healthcare. We have so many helping professions and so people don't always recognize those implicit internal biases that they've developed over time um, and how that relates to, to the patient outcomes. So we know that bias in healthcare results in a lot of issues with hiring, promotion, and staff retention. Uh, we know that it, it has an effect on patient provider interactions. Um, I think every ombudsman can testify to speaking with residents about, you know, I feel like this staff member just doesn't like me because. And, and then that creates an issue with trust in that team relationship. Um, the treatment decisions that might be offered to a person by providers, um, you know, perhaps that provider has some implicit bias that they're not recognizing. And so all options aren't put on the table. And then of course the treatment adherence by patients, not only their biases, but how, again, how they perceive the bias of their healthcare providers. And then of course the patient health outcomes, what ultimately happens to this person, <clears throat> excuse me, as a result of potential implicit or explicit biases. So I'm gonna start by saying, when I start off in a facility by, by providing this, I try to make a very, simple, straight to the point, and relatively entertaining session about bias, again, to lower those defenses. And I tell people, my goal today is just to, to get you to start thinking about yourself and your team and the residents we provide um, care for. And a lot of times, most of the time, those teams, the group that all works together on a regular basis, will talk openly about um, the the specific biases that you might be talking about. So one that comes up often, and I like to mention is the blind spot bias that uh, most of you recognize. And that's, um, you know, when we, when we talk about the biases that other people have, but we don't recognize our own. And I always say the most important part of a team is your team members keeping you in check. We don't have to like our team members, but we definitely have to respect them. So when someone says to us, hey, you know, I think you might, you might want to reconsider this position or I noticed that this occurred and I'd like to talk to you about a potential bias. It's important to listen. Um, and one that comes up a lot actually when I speak with residents is the issue of smoking. And I think that any ombudsman would, would um, know the drill. They talk about how the, the staff might come in and tell them that they're not allowed to smoke or they need to stop smoking for their health status and the resident doesn't want to quit smoking. Um, and meanwhile, the, the health professional who's saying this just came in from a cigarette break and smells like smoke. So that in turn makes it much harder for the patient, the client, to, to listen to what that healthcare provider is saying. That's an example I might give because there are going to be people in the group that are smokers or aren't smokers, and it's an easy thing to recognize um, by the team that you're working with. Another that just comes up all the time are outcome biases. And we see this in healthcare and especially in long-term care when the staff are against a particular choice for a resident. Um, and of course we know about um, people always saying the, the potential risks of a discharge, an unsafe discharge. Um, but another issue that comes up a lot is food actually. When a resident chooses a diet that maybe healthcare professionals don't feel is appropriate. And so, a good example of that is potentially um, when a soft diet is recommended or a puree diet, 
and the resident is saying, I don't want that puree diet. I don't care if I choke to death, I want that cheeseburger. Um, so pointing out and, and always reinforcing that, that the resident has this choice um, if it's an informed decision and how are our biases affecting how we're helping this resident to meet their highest potential quality of life. Um, hindsight bias is a big one. Um, this is when you know something, so you assume other people know this as well. And I feel like sometimes the more I learn about something, the more I just assume that everybody else knows that. And I deal a lot with that when, when I'm working with, for, for instance, someone with um, diabetes. Someone with diabetes may not have all the education that you have about that illness and about potential diet that might help them. So we just assume that this individual knows about their disease because they've had it for so long or what have you, or they've had many providers talk to them or they've had many education sessions, but we don't know necessarily what they know or don't know. So you always have to recognize that, that you don't know what you don't know about a person. Confirmation bias, um, we're all familiar with in the day and age of social media. We tend to find information that supports our bias um, and overlook information that doesn't support that bias. And again, we see this with resident care all of the time. Um, someone will bring up all of the, the potential bad things that could happen and um, look, you know, this is, this is what always happens. They're not willing to look at some potential other information that could be beneficial. Attribution bias is when we really, we think that other people are making bad choices. That's the easiest way to put it. But when we are forced to make those choices and perhaps our choice is bad, we feel like we had to do it. We had to do it, but that other person had a choice. This comes up a lot when we're dealing with someone who maybe has addiction issues. Um, we might have providers who assume that it was their choice and they continue to keep using and they continue to have this lifestyle. And, and that creates a huge barrier in care and trust in the team. Self-serving bias is kind of related to that. We think, hey, when we do something awesome, that's because we are awesome ourselves. When someone else does something equally or more as awesome, we say, well, they, they had help or they didn't do it on their own. And that doesn't give someone full credit for what they've experienced and gone through. Anchoring bias comes up a lot. A great example of this, uh, you know, when you, when you get first information that sticks in your head, and so it's difficult to kind of change that. I see anchoring bias a lot. Um, for instance, if I have an individual who has suffered a stroke and perhaps their family, you know, the, the person with the stroke maybe is having communication problems. And maybe I have a family member who's saying, I don't want them to have certain types of therapy or certain types of interventions because this first doctor I talked to when mom first had the stroke told me that she would never speak again. So I just don't, I don't wanna put her through that. We have to remind them that, that it's always up to the resident and that we can't use our own biases in that. Um, we have to consider how they're feeling and, and understand that there is other information out there and that things do change over time. So, um, you know, I just have a brief amount of time, but I do want to say that the, the best ways to help reduce bias is to practice self-awareness. And the beginning of that is developing a training program um, that helps people to begin to recognize that and to give them the comfort, to give them um, permission to talk to each other about that. And I loved what was said earlier about how, you know, there, there are definitely going to be people who are resistant to that. Sometimes those people are the, the people that just amaze you the most and change the most in recognizing, you know, what can be changed, what can be different about themselves and, and how they approach these issues. Um, and it's important to tell them, as was said earlier, this is the direction we're going. This is the team we want. We want a team that recognizes their own bias and does something about it. So practicing that self-awareness, part of that is um, this reviewing and retraining often. You can't give a, you know, people ask me for these sessions and they say, well, we want once a year for 20 minutes. And they feel like that, that might satisfy the need. 
once a year for 20 minutes isn't enough. This is something that has to be done on a, on a really regular basis and whenever a problem comes up and saying that we as a team are always going to address these issues. And teaching people how to provide feedback respectfully and how to accept that feedback from others. Sometimes people don't have the right words. So we do have to understand that. But we also have to do our best when we're trying to, to notify someone that we have concerns to say, I'm your team member and I, I'm saying this to you because you know it concerns me and I, I want to be a good team member with you. Finding respectful ways to say that, whether it's an I statement, whether um, it's making sure that that person is in a safe environment when you talk to them, where they don't feel attacked, those types of things. Um, and when bias is identified, it has to be faced and changed. I always ask when I'm giving a presentation on bias, especially in a nursing home, that their ethics team be a part of that training, meaning that they are sitting in the room. So, and I ask them to identify themselves. A lot of staff don't even know who their ethics team is or, or that they have one um, maybe in their organization. And to say, you know, when, when we have an issue of bias and we have people recognizing that on our team, it needs to be brought maybe before the ethics committee and encourage that discussion of how that might happen. So, you know, I only had a few minutes today, but, you know, my, my goal is to really say to everybody, it's not hard to make a training about bias and you will learn more and more um, about the teams and about bias itself and your own biases every time you give a presentation. And I've never given a bias, bias presentation where, where I haven't left and had people from the group report, hey, that, that really made me think about something, or I was able to, uh, you know, because of what we talked about in this, able to identify a potential issue with a resident. Um, another thing that might help when you're doing this is to actually go around the facility and say to, you, say to the residents who live there, hey, I'm, I've been asked to do a training on bias for the staff, and I'm, I just wanna ask the people who live here, do you think that the staff have any biases? And presenting that to the team that you're training to say, these were identified here, how do you feel about them? And initially, again, you might be greeted with a lot of defensiveness, some anger. Um, and so you work through that as a group together and that's part of training. So um, I really hope that everyone gets out there and starts encouraging their nursing homes when, when in all the states we can visit again, to take you up on some bias training for their staff from a source outside of their facility that can appear less biased. And I believe that's it. Sarah, thank you so much. Um, lots of good information and um, appreciate your uh, um, willingness to share your thoughts and, and encouraging other people to, to take, their, take this out and, and do the training. Um, we're gonna turn it over to Joe Rodriguez, the California State Ombudsman. Joe, it's all yours. Thank you, Carol. Let me try and share my screen here. Okay, can you see that? You are perfect. All right, great, thank you. Um, good to be with you all this afternoon. Carol asked me to talk about um, a module that we added to our core curriculum training for local ombudsman representatives. Um, it's around sensitivity to LGBT or lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender issues. The purpose of this training was to fulfill um, California requirements for ombudsman training prior to certification in cultural competency and sensitivity to the underserved um, aging, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community. So this bill, Assembly Bill 663, um, was a bill that we were tracking at the state office. And initially the training was, was targeted toward um, long-term care facility staff. It wasn't until, um, it was much later in the session that um, we, the bill was amended to add ombudsman representatives uh, should also receive this, this training. And when we saw that addition in that amendment late in the session, we thought, sure, we can do that. That's, that's easy to do. So, um, 
what we did was initially, this was um, still in, in 2013 when we were still um, coming out of the, the recession and didn't have a lot of resources. We, we cobbled together um, a series of, of uh, videos and resources that we were able to um, get from, from a couple sources, um, from the Resource Center, from um, SAGE, and we made these materials available to our, our program coordinators for use in the, uh, in the training. The bill itself didn't specify any particular topics to include in the training or any length of time. So it left it pretty wide open for us to put something together that, that just dealt with sensitivity. Um, I think it's interesting to note that in that poll that was taken earlier, um, only one person responded that they look at sexual orientation. And the uh, characteristic that got the most votes for, for something that, that's most overlooked is sexual orientation. Um, it's about, I think, you know, not making assumptions, not just thinking everybody in your facility is straight. I remember when we were releasing this curriculum to our, our local programs, I got a couple of comments from program coordinators in some of our more um, rural areas uh, that said, we don't need this training. We really don't because we don't have any gay people in our facilities. Well, you're making an assumption. Your, 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 your thought may not be an accurate one. Your assumption may not be accurate because you do have gay people, you do have lesbian people, you do have bisexual people, you do have transgender people in your facilities. You just don't know it. Um, so this new chapter that we, that we finally developed um, discusses issues encountered by the LGBT older adults um, in our communities to enable ombudsman representatives to provide competent and sensitive services to LGBT individuals. Um, our curriculum um, that we use here in California is based on the NORC curriculum. We've customized it for California and we have other chapters that we've added to the curriculum that were written by Sarah Hunt Many of you know Sarah, she, she's now retired, but was a uh, longtime uh, consultant to both the National Ombudsman Resource Center and the National Association of State Ombudsman Programs. She wrote um, our California curriculum and, and has updated it a couple of times. And we, um, we wanted the, the curriculum chapter or module to have the same voice as the other chapters. So once we were, um, in a better position financially here in California, we hired Sarah to construct this, this module for us. Um, the content builds on, on the knowledge and skills um, that are taught in previous chapters of the core curriculum, like the problem solving process, and intersects with, with those chapters um, in a way that, that builds upon the other knowledge that, that our students receive prior to certification. Joe, Joe, may you uh, speak up a little, little bit more? Sure, sure. Thank you. So um, this is what the uh, title page to the curriculum chapter looks like. It's called Cultural Competency and Sensitivity and Issues Relating to the Underserved, Aging, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community. Um, Sarah worked on this for us in early 2018, and we released it at our spring conference in April of 2018. Um, it's really not a very long chap chapter. We've got an introduction that kind of sets the frame for why we're doing this. It talks about um, the population of the LGBT community, some definitions, um, life experiences and long-term care, how, you know, because of historic um, prejudice and discrimination and hatred uh, against the LGBT community, um, those experiences may shape how people uh, relate to their long-term care providers and staff. Um, we know that, that um, in, in many situations, LGBT residents who 
had previously been out of the closet in the community after you know many years of of fear and discrimination may go back into the facility um, for fear of being treated differently. Um, you know, our, our representatives need to understand that um, many people experienced uh, violence, um, discrimination, um, a distrust of the government, a distrust of um, churches, a distrust of healthcare professionals, fear of being treated differently because they're, they're a member of the LGBT community. Um, and our, our representatives need to be mindful of that as well. So we created some tips for ombudsman representatives for working with L the LGBT community to make our representatives more sensitive, to not assume um, things, and to, you know, to be able to interact and advocate for, for these residents that are in our facilities. Um, we also included some key resources for advocacy um, and some additional some, uh, some other additional resources that I'll talk about later. So the learning objectives for the training um, are, is to ensure that ombudsman representatives will know the basic definitions of terms, um, LGBT concerns related to long-term care services, tips for working with LGBT individuals, and tools and resources to use in advocacy and education. The development of the curriculum um, and, the, and the core content was based on nationally recognized training and uses resources from the National Resource Center on LGBT aging. They've got some great short videos um, for long-term care facility staff in how to, how to be sensitive and work in working with the LGBT community and how to make your facility LGBT friendly. Um, resources from the National Long-Term Care Ombudsman Resource Center and others, and I mentioned SAGE earlier. Um, it's focused on ombudsman program services, so it's very particular to the work that we do. Um, for the, the, the new chapter 10 that we added to our curriculum, it includes the curriculum resource material, the actual uh, chapter for, for the students to read, teaching notes for the instructor, and a PowerPoint presentation um, with scripted notes. The agenda uh, for the training is, is a 90 minute uh, training without breaks. Uh, there's a teaching outline that, that has space for notes for the instructor in case the instructor wants to point out particular items or, or add items that, that aren't necessarily in the, uh, in the curriculum. There are links to the videos to use, handouts, and a PowerPoint presentation again with, with notes. Um, after, um, this bill passed, which created a um, the, the requirement for training for ombudsman representatives and for facility staff. Um, another bill was was uh, enacted that established an LGBT residence bill of rights, and the bill of rights is in our California Health and Safety Code, uh, section fourteen thirty nine point five zero through fourteen thirty nine point five four, and as it states here. Um, it's unlawful for a long-term care facility or for facility staff to take any of the following actions wholly or partially on the basis of a person's actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, or HIV status. And we've included the Bill of Rights in the training curriculum to remind people that, that LGBT residents, in addition to their regular residence rights that we have established in federal and state law, also have these additional rights. Facilities cannot deny admission to a long-term care facility, transfer or refuse to transfer a resident within a facility or to another facility, or discharge or evict a resident from a facility. They can't deny a request by residents to share a room where rooms are assigned by gender, assigning, reassigning, or refusing to assign a room to a transgender resident other than in accordance with the transgender resident's gender identity, unless at the res at unless at the transgender resident's request. It prohibits a resident from using or, or harass a resident um, who seeks to use or does use a restroom available to other persons of the same gender identity. Um, it willfully and repeatedly for, it prohibits willful and, and repeated failure to use a resident's preferred name 
or pronouns after being clearly informed of the resident's preferred name or pronouns. Um, facilities cannot deny a resident the right to wear or be dressed in clothing, accessories, or cosmetics that are permitted for any other resident. Um, they can't restrict a resident's rights, right to associate with other residents or, or with visitors, including the right to consensual sexual relations, unless the restriction is uniformly applied to all residents in a non-discriminatory discriminatory manner. They can't deny or restrict medical or non-medical care that is appropriate to a resident's organs and bodily needs or provide medical or non-medical care um, in a manner that uh, to a similarly situated reasonable person unduly demeans the resident's dignity or causes avoidable discomfort. Um, and finally, um, the facilities required to post the, the notice below um, in its facility and on all materials that they, that they publish that this policy is posted, that they don't discriminate, they do not per permit discrimination, including but not limited to bullying, abuse or harassment on the basis of actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression or HIV status or based on association with another individual on account of that individual's actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, or HIV status. You can file a complaint with the Office of the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman if you believe that you have experienced this kind of discrimination. So, you know, I think, you know, we've, we've got some very good law on the books now that help protect residents. Um, we've got this training now that we provide to all of our, our Ombudsman staff and volunteers. And, um, I think these are good ways of sensitizing our staff and volunteers um, to the fact that there are LGBT residents and facilities, no matter where we are in this state, and that as ombudsmen, we have to do our best to advocate for their rights as well. Thank you. Joe, thank you so much. Um, we had one question that came in. Um, is the G admitted uh, omitted because for older adults the word queer has very negative memories in many long-term care facilities there are queer persons who might view this as exclusion will q eventually be included i i think so um you know for for many um lesbian gay bisexual transgender people of a certain age cohort the word queer is 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 offensive to them. Um, it's scary. It's it's a it's a sign of of, of um, a negative experience of, of being called a name, and it's not embraced um, like it is with um, younger younger persons in the LGBT community. But I think over over time, as as maybe uh, younger people get older, you know, we 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 might need to revisit that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I've kind of been trying to keep up with the questions and everything. Um, I and now I can't. Of course, now I can't see them now that I've put this on here. So I don't know if anything has come in in the last uh, minute or two. Um, Joe, Sarah, Tawara, um, great information. Um, we have been um, including. Oh, there we go. Um, Um, we have been uh, including in the in the chat the uh, links to the um, PowerPoints, um, and that is the same place that the record that this recording will go. Um, I do want to um, mention a couple of resources that the uh, Ombudsman Resource Center has. Um, we do have the uh, chapter that. Uh, just just talking about um, that the California program includes it with their training. Um, it is this first one um, here. Yeah, it's this first one here in cultural competency and sensitivity. Um, we also have uh, several p uh, different kinds of materials uh, relating to tribal elders and ombudsman services on um, on this link, and we also have. 
um, some information about uh, working with younger residents on this link on the um, Ombudsman uh, webpage or website. A couple of other sources uh, of information about cultural diversity, just kind of in general, the administration for community living has an entire page and the um, US Department of Health and Human Services Office of uh, Minority Health also has information. Um, this is the contact information. Um, if you want to email any of the speakers today. Um, and I want to say that uh, we do, uh, from the Resource Center, send out quarterly newsletters and a monthly source. If you are not getting those directly into your e email, um, uh, email box, um, feel free to go to this link and sign up and we will include you on um, all of our um, all of our emails um, and so and then just a, uh, a reminder that the Ombudsman program does have an app um, you can search in the Apple Store or Google Play LTC Ombudsman Resource Center and um, there are uh, all kinds of resources out there um, okay so now I am going to um, stop sharing and if you guys want to pop back on we've got two minutes and three questions um okay the oh the it of earlier was linguistic competency as in i.e it's also volume manner of speaking and eye contact as part of linguistic competency? I think that may be directed at me and we're looking broadly at all forms of communication. Okay. Um, okay, I see part of an answer here, but I don't see the whole answer. Um, I mean, I don't see the whole question. I think if you have any questions about the training on LGBT, it might be best just to get a hold of um, of Joe um, and see how they handle things. I think Joe, this is a the issue of you know using the women's restroom at the nursing home or or not. And I think probably that's more of a one on one conversation than, but but it's probably a good conversation for everyone to have to say how do you how do you um, advocate for a resident who's being discriminated against. Right. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah. So, so if a transgender resident, um, uh, let's say a, a man who identifies as a woman, that person has a right to use the women's restroom. Um, it's plain and simple. Okay. And we would, we would advocate for that for the resident. Okay. If I might add to that well, just know, briefly. I, and I, I just want to throw in there, it's sometimes a great way, um, it, you know, we often hear staff members talking about the biases of residents without recognizing their own. And they say, we have a bias problem amongst our residents not accepting another resident. Invite the residents to the bias training that you're having. Tell staff, you know, I'm inviting the residents to come too. Let's have an open discussion about this community. I, I didn't mean to jump in there, Joe, but I mean, it's something to consider to, to invite the residents to your trainings. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. The bias is, is something everyone has. And um, sometimes the filter <laughs> that people have, they've kind of lost. And so by being trained on it um, might uh, kick that back in. I tell you, we could talk about, we could go on for hours. Um, and I know we, to, we, we tested Tawara to see if she could do a two day training in 45 minutes and doggone if you didn't do it. So um, more power to you. And Sarah, I know your presentation um, is normally many hours. And so we appreciate your uh, bringing it down and Joe, the same thing. Um, can't thank you guys enough. Um, Please, everyone, as you're leaving, be sure and complete the survey. Um, and uh, thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. And everyone, please stay safe. Thank you. Bye.